everybody. Please take your seats quickly. We're going to start this panel now. Uh, welcome back. It's the last panel of a long day, so thank you for bearing with us and joining us. Take your seats quickly so we can listen up. My name is Sally Nisho, and I'm going to moderate this last panel, which is asking the question, how gender equality creates sustainable cities? Just how is everybody feeling? Probably a little hot and tired. So hope you can relax, enjoy this last session, and let it all sink in. No interactivity, or at least no jumping up in this session today. So we're going to talk about gender equality and the climate crisis. Uh, and how the two are connected at city level. They're both urgent challenges, and we also know that the climate crisis is not gender neutral. So we're going to spend the next 45 minutes talking and thinking about those critical connections we can make between equality, equity, and the climate mitigation and adaptation that all of our cities are doing at local level. We're going to also hear some of the work that Urbac's been doing at program level, at city level, and also some good practice from cities in Sweden and in Spain. But before we start, we're going to do some polling. So if you could switch to Slido, the same as we had before, slido.com, hashtag UCF2, if you get, get online and participate in a little poll to see uh, what you're all what your level of knowledge is, and some questions around the connections between gender and the climate crisis. So once everybody's online, perhaps we could have the first question. So Diego, if you could launch the poll. Here we go. So a general question first, on a scale of 1 to 10, how inspired are you so far by the Urbac City Festival? Let's see what you can score on that. Yes, I actually thought about having a parallel question, which was, how hot are you? And I think we'd get the same level of scoring. Uh, so good. So we've got a good level of inspiration so far. It's been an amazing, busy day, a lot of programming. And thank you all so much for the level of engagement that we've witnessed in all of the sessions across the festival. Oh, we've got one, three, good. So pretty, pretty inspired, good to see. And we've got 39 people on board on the poll. So thanks for that. Let's go to the next question, please. So the next question is getting onto the topic of this panel. My city implements gender mainstreaming in our climate policies. You have the option, no, I don't know, or yes. So this is what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Are you already mainstreaming on gender in your climate policies? 66% say no, 33% don't know. Kind of kind of what we predicted, but hopefully after this panel, you might have some more ideas about how to address this, to start doing gender mainstreaming across climate policies at local level. So thanks for answering that. Next, next question, please. Who do you think makes most consumption decisions? Men, women, or is it equal? So who, who is making the most decisions about consumption? Okay, you've got, let's see, we've got 35 answers. Okay. Okay, we've got women at 50% men at 28% equal 22. Well, most of the research shows that women make 70 to 80% of consumption decisions. That's uh, the, the thinking about what gets consumed, for instance, on a daily basis. And that also relates to things like uh, resource management, food, housing, energy. So just quite interesting to think who's doing the thinking and the deciding. That's, that's research from Harvard, from Forbes, from Bloomberg. Fairly, fairly generally, women are making many more consumption decisions than men. Next question, please. Questions about representation here. In 2020, what was the percentage of national environmental ministries across 193 global countries that are led by women? So how many environmental ministries at national level are led by women? Yeah, and you're getting it right, 15%. There we go. So most people have understood it's only 15% of ministers on, an, on environmental policy are women. And we'll go to the last question, kind of a similar question, which is more European. 
This is, this is data from the, EU, e, the European Institute for Gender Equality who produce the most amazing data sets. Have a look at them. You can get completely lost in them. Across EU 27, in 2020, what was the percentage of women executives in the mining, energy, water, construction industries? Yeah, and you're right, you're right the answer is 5%. So. So we can see there's some representation gaps that are going on and some uh, in interesting issues around behavior and sustainability. So uh, next up, I'm going to introduce our panel, who are going to help us with this talk. If we could have the panel, thank you. This is the panel that we're going to help us have this think about this today. Great uh, panel of experts from different perspectives. We have, first of all, Nula Morgan, who's head of unit for communication and capitalization in Urbact. I think most of you will know Nula. Then we have Bianca Drea, who is an urban researcher and consultant based in Berlin, who's been one of the authors of the updated version of the Gender Equal Cities report. And then Bianca will talk to us a bit about that and also the elements of that report that relate to sustainability. Um, then we have Linda Gustafsson with us. Linda is a gender strategist from the city of Umeå in Sweden, uh, been very involved in Urbact in the last few years, particularly on gender. And then we have Ander Bergara Sauta, who's head of unit from Emma Kunde, which is the Basque Institute for Women in Spain. So thank you so much for joining us on the panel. We're going to start with opening statements from the panelists. So Nula, would you like to go ahead and kick off? Yes, thank you, Sally. And uh, a warm, very warm welcome to, to all of you. So, um, and I'm also delighted to be on the panel, even at the end of a very hot day, to talk about this uh, pressing issue. So I'm responsible at Urbact for the thematic capitalization and knowledge sharing strategy and for also putting the Gender Equal Cities work on the program uh, back in 2017. And when we were talking about the, this as a, as a priority theme, we were looking at um, how it fits with, with Urbact. Urbact has always been built on the principles of sustainable and integrated uh, urban development. So when we talk about sustainable urban development, one way of looking at it is um, ensuring that the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And in the framework of our work in, uh, in, in Urbact, using uh, European funds, the various dimensions of, of urban life, economic, social, uh, cultural, environmental, we know that they're interwoven and that any success in urban development uh, projects can only be achieved through an integrated approach. Well, our definition of success in any case. And when we're looking for the, the, the urgent action that cities need to take on climate, we are also mindful of the need for this to be a, a just transition. And it was talked about uh, today, earlier in sessions, and, and also yesterday. So again, ensuring that this um, integrated approach is, uh, is taken on board. But when we're talking about the needs of, of cities, uh, as Sally mentioned, who is deciding who those, what those needs are? Uh, and can a policy or, or action be considered sustainable if it only takes account of certain needs and not others? So this question again of, um, uh, of, of, of the integrated approach, but also the justice approach in terms of, um, of our backed activities. Um, another statistic, uh, women account for half of the population, but only 15% of mayors are female and 29% and of local councillors, which we saw uh, in, in our report. So this also, again, has an impact on um, the, the thinking process about what is sustainable integrated urban development. And we know, we've heard also um, yesterday, that when we look at the city from a gendered perspective, we see the city is used in different ways by women and men. Cities have traditionally been mainly designed uh, by men with the male perspective considered as the neutral one. And yet we know that due, due to different gender norms and the different roles played by men and women in society, that the, the, the approach to, to using the city and public spaces is different in terms of use of public transport, in terms of, of work and, and caregiving. So all that to say that for us, the integrated approach is necessarily an inclusive approach uh, as well that, uh, that takes in everything. Uh, and so that's why we, we wanted to really focus on, uh, on gender equality in, in um, urban planning and, and urban policy making. A second uh, element uh, concerns also the context in which we work uh, with 
gender equality being a, or equality between men and women being a, one of the finding principles in the European Union uh, treaties, enshrined in all of those treaties since uh, 1958. Uh, and also then with the Sustainable Development Goals, the, we have a dedicated objective, uh, SDG 5. Uh, and so the, this is, it's obviously not a new topic, it's been around for a long time, but the, the difficulty often with horizontal issues or issues that, that need to be considered everywhere is sometimes they're not really considered anywhere directly. So we also wanted to move past the fact that sometimes it's a box ticking exercise to say, yes, I've thought about gender, yes, I've thought about climate, yes, tick, tick. And to really try and focus on uh, how practically we can uh, give concrete examples to, uh, to our beneficiaries and to cities on how to really um, turn that into practice. We know, we have asked these questions ourselves in, in you know, in the, in the applications that, that, you, uh, that you submit. And often we, we get the, the input uh, around representation in urban local groups, for example, to ensure that representative is there. And that's important, but it is uh, just one aspect of gender equality. So it's important, but not the only one. And so since we were lacking a little bit in concrete practices and uh, experiences, and uh, what we like to do is to, to show you how other cities are doing it, so we decided to explore uh, and to see where those um, principles that have been enshrined for so long are being put into practice. And we saw this practice um, through uh, Umia initially, so it's, uh, it's uh, also great to, to follow the, um, the work that they're doing. Erbacht had a good practice call in 2017, and this was instrumental in kicking off our, our capitalization work. So we did a call out to all cities to, to submit their, their good practices, and we received uh, the, the case of Umea, and they were awarded a good practice label for their gendered bus tour. And this is a, a fantastic, I believe, uh, visit. Sally, you've done it recently. The, the city of Umea provides bus tours around the city to show the, the gendered landscape of Umea. Umea, if I say it right. <laughs> This is, um, I think, a really innovative way of showing how working with gender equality takes form in the city and also showing what changes can be made and should be made and what works in the city and also what, highlighting what, uh, what doesn't work. So based on this, let's say, uh, concrete practice, we launched the Gender Equal Cities Working Group with Umia, with um, other partners, uh, and we went to uncover these good practices and, uh, uh, and help uh, cities translate these high-level principles into something that they can apply in their, in their everyday work. So we've partnered with, the, the, with CEMR, who have done some outstanding work as well with their Charter for Equality and Local Life, to combine our efforts also to bring their Charter to life. Uh, they'll also be here tomorrow, colleagues from CEMR uh, at the, in the exhibition area. So. Yeah, through, through the, um, the Gender Equal Cities report, the action planning network made by UMIA, we're, we're, we're really trying to, to promote this um, greater awareness of the topic uh, within Urbact and going across uh, all of the different topics that, uh, that our cities are working on. Thanks, Nula. It's a great sort of introduction for those who don't know of what the program has been doing, um, including city networking on gender equality. Just before I hand over to Bianca, I want to say we are being live streamed and also you can post questions on Slido. Please do post any questions or comments you have for us and we'll be able to see them and we'll bring them in um, after the panelists have all had an input. So I'm going to ask Bianca to tell us a bit about this updated version of the Gender Equal Cities report and Bianca, how you see these connections between gender and climate crisis. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I'm a gender and social inclusion expert with Urbac, but I'm also a researcher in just sustainable urban transformations. Um, my background is in community psychology, and therefore I really work from the ground up. And even though this panel right now is titled How Gender Equality Creates Sustainable Cities, we could reverse the question. Um, because those two topics are really inherently interlinked and can't really be considered uh, without one another. Um, as Nula alluded to, when sustainability was first envisioned um, in the new urban agenda, the sustainable development goals, 
really it was a goal to create environmentally healthy, socially just, and economically fair cities and societies. Um, but we've heard throughout the day, and uh, I was uh, there during the opening pl uh, panel last night, that in practice, that is not really implemented as such. And we can have arguments around you know, why that might be uh, the case. Um, in the literature, we refer to what's happening in sustainability as uh, the equity deficit. So there is an equity deficit when it comes to sustainability work. Um, and gender, of course, is a really important dimension of that equity deficit. Um, and that's why the, the Urbag Gender Equal Cities report that was launched today at lunch and uh, I co-authored with Dr. Mary dallenbaugh Lasse, who many of you um, have seen, who's also the lead uh, expert for the Gendered Landscape Action Planning Network. Um, it was really important for us to include a chapter on sustainability and climate change in that report to highlight how these, how these two topics um, are linked together. So we know from research that if sustainability solutions don't consider equity, and gender being one of those dimensions, they fail. And they fail because they're not adapted or supported by the public. They fail because they can increase harm and uh, increase existing inequities. Or sometimes they fail because they actually don't even achieve the sustainability targets that they aim for. Um, and I'd like to illustrate this by a little anecdote of my previous home city, which is Kitchener-Waterloo in Canada, um, close-ish to Toronto, which might ring more of a bell. Um, I was involved in an evaluation of the development of a new light rail transit system that went through the downtown and connected communities to the two big universities. And really the aim was to reduce the emissions of the urban center, a really important target. What was not considered in that approach was that many of the urban residents that were in the center were already using public transit. They relied on the bus system. They were generally lower income residents that already had lower consumption levels. And so what we realized was that not only did um, this LRT development lead to gentrification, people were driven out of their homes, new condo towers came up that drastically changed the face of the city, and there was a lot of pushback from the public. Um, equity dimensions weren't considered. There were no clauses put into effect that affordable housing had to be implemented along the line. Um, and still the city was always able to argue, well, you know, it's really for the benefit of the environment. We have to take those hits if we want to make a change because, you know, the earth is not forgiving. However, what we saw was that the people that ended up moving into the developed area consume more because they earn more. And because of their higher consumption, the overall emissions actually went up. <laughs> so uh, this is why it's really important to keep considering those two things really as interlinked and together. So that's why when we talk about gender, we actually don't talk about women. I mean, of course we talk about women, but we also talk about queer people, we talk about uh, people of color, we talk about people on low income. We consider gender from an intersectional perspective that you know, really goes across. And it's not about, or not just about, increasing the involvement of women, but it's really about recognizing that it's about gendered power structures, it's about norms, it's about social practices, and it's about how these lead to, also, as you know, Nula mentioned, this neutralizing of the male, mostly the white, wealthy, Western notions of exploitation, like domination, consumption, 
that we normalize in our society and we take for granted. And so these power structures, they harm everyone. So they harm people of all genders, they harm people of you know, all classes. We know that you know, in more unequal societies, actually everyone fares worse. And so when we then think about climate change mitigation, so preventing um, you know, the ongoing climate crises, we have to think about tackling these power structures. And that, of course, includes in representation, uh, but it also includes rethinking very fundamentally you know, some of the things we take for granted, like our economic models. And then when we think about adaptation, it's really crucial to think about you know, who benefits and who has to carry the burden of these interventions. And in the Gender Equal Cities report, uh, we have Umio as our case study where we highlight that when we think about, for example, um, changing our buses to electric uh, bus systems, that of course makes a lot of sense from an environmental perspective. A gendered perspective then also thinks about you know, these burdens, they could be very obvious, like the case that I mentioned before in Kitchener-Waterloo, but they can also be hidden. And Umeo's case, that's really a hidden inequity that gets implemented because we also through research know that women feel safe in the company of a bus driver. And so what does it mean if women are the ones using public transit more and now we're changing the public transit system into a system that no longer serves their needs, that makes them feel unsafe. And how can we start to really think about these things in tandem and include everyone in the conversations? Okay, thanks, Bianca. Um, and that's some of the questions around equity and sustainability. We had a conference, the Gendered Landscape Network had a conference in Umeå last week, their final conference. And some of the debate was about economic models that underpin the gendered nature of the labor market and the way that works, and going potentially from a, a concept of profit to care, from break things fast to tend and repair and cooperate. So if you put it into the bigger picture of macroeconomics, I think those things we need to come into play in the conversation. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Linda now, who's going to tell us hopefully some really concrete examples of what you're doing at local level in Umeå uh, in terms of gender work linked to sustainability. Hi. Uh, I'll do that before I melt into <laughs> this, <laughs> this chair. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Linda. I work for the city of Umeå. Uh, together with Annika, my colleague, we're the, also the project leaders of the Gendered Landscape Action Planning Network. And we, I know that in the room we have uh, our project partners as well. La Rochelle, Celie, Barcelona, Panevicius, um, Tricala, and Barcelona. Um, in the Gendered Landscape uh, Action Planning Network, we worked with different policy challenges, but it's been from the perspective of two things. We've always we've talked about gender equality needs to be globally understood and locally contextualized. So we need to understand gender inequality as a global problem and we need to understand our local context to see what sort of intervention do we need to make in order to create more gender equal cities. And in that also understanding what we call the gendered landscape, uh, which the gendered landscape bus tour is a, uh, an example of showing the gendered landscape. And every city is a gendered landscape. Everyone lives in a gendered landscape. It's about understanding what Bianca was saying also, gendered power structures and how they are made visible in the cities that we live in. Uh, that women and men uh, make different amounts of money, that women and men in many countries work in different areas, that women are more responsible for the unpaid housework, that women are more affected by violence so on, so on, so on. So understanding the gender landscape in order to see what kind of interventions do we need to do in, uh, to that suits, understands gender inequality, but fits our city. And it's also about understanding the context of the city, of course. Where do people work in this city? Is, uh, is there a large industry in this city? Is this a university city? What is the history of this city? 
also, of course, connected to what is the history of this country. What sort of legislation do we have, of course? And in our network, we have very different support when it comes to gen working with gender equality, both on local and regional and national level. But what we have seen in the project is that through, for example, master classes on mo mobility, climate change, gender equality, we've been able to really deepen the knowledge together and, and find interventions. Uh, Umeå is... Umeå. Yeah. <laughs> Umeå is... Uh, <laughs> also one of the 100 uh, cities in the EU mission to become climate neutral. And one of the things that we highlighted was integrating gender equality in that work. Um, as has been said already, understanding norms, uh, understanding identity and how that connects to behavior uh, but also, of course, participation, who has the possibility to participate, who is expected to make changes and who decides about what changes need to be made. Um, and to give some more concrete examples of work, um, one of the things, yes, transport, mobility, um, we use, and what we've also talked a lot about in the, the in the network is using data, gender segregated data. Uh, doing surveys is also one way. Um, and what we know in Umeå is that uh, women travel more sustainable than men. Um, women take the bus, uh, or women and men take the bus to all, women take the bus more than men do. Uh, and women also do something that very few men in Umeå do, they walk to work. That's the largest difference is actually in walking. Um, but when it comes to then the, the differences, there are differences in the public transportation in when it comes to women and men taking the bus. And then the question that we ask and what is also in the, the also connected to what Bianca was talking about is, is it more efficient to electrify the bus fleet or to get men to take the bus? And if we do the math and we, can, we if we do the math and see, okay, so how, how much emissions are we going to save by electrifying the bus fleet? How much emissions are we going to save if we get 15% more men into a bus instead of taking a car? It's obvious you get men to take the bus. So it's about targeting interventions. What is the best intervention also in mitigating climate change? So targeting, for example, male dominated workplaces when it comes to changes in mobility, because there's no really no point in the city of Umeå targeting female dominated workplaces when it comes to changing the way we transport ourselves because women already travel sustainable. So we target the male dominated workplaces or another example for um, the energy company who has the possibility to make changes when it comes to housing. So the possibility to, instead of buying solar panels, you can rent sol solar panels from the energy company. You can rent solar panels. So you don't have to make such a large investment. And we know that women have less money. What you also get is support and knowledge. You don't have to learn everything there is to know about solar panels to put them on your house. So that's also a way of integrating uh, an understanding of who has the possibility to access a solution. But then also just making sure that our public spaces are uh, planned and built with an understanding of gender equality and gender inequality so that they also encourage more sustainable modes of transportation. That people in the city want to walk there they want to bike there, they want to take the bus because you're not scared at the bus station and the bike lanes work for you even if you're traveling with a large cargo bike filled with kids and grocery shopping and everything. Um, I think I'll stop there, Sally. Yeah. <laughs>
I thanks so much. We know from Umio there's lots more stories and lots more inspiring examples. And I think for the work we've done at Back Level, this whole issue about data has become so apparent that Umio can have these kind of policy discussions and make different decisions because they, they've got the data. They, know, they understand that city, who's moving where, who's working where, how much do they earn, what, how much can they afford. It's really a big part of it. And I think in, in the conference last week, I just saw an amazing statistic from some of the mobility research, actually not in, in, in Umeå, that where they'd calculated this whole issue around carbon emission reduction if men travelled less in cars in the way that women do. But also it was they'd, cal they'd calculated they would liberate 192 public squares by taking that many cars off the streets. So parking, that's another equity issue for me. Who gets the space of a city included in, in that kind of debate? I'm going to bring Ander in, and then we've got three questions on Slido, and then I think we'll have to start wrapping up because we've been this, it's, it's, it's been a, a long day, and we want to wrap up on time so you guys get to leave on time. But Ander, I'd like to bring you in with your perspective from Emma Kunde. OK, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to to say that the green transition must be just and there is no climate justice without gender equality. From our experience in the Basque country, there are at least three key elements to a gender just ecological uh, transition. First one, women's leadership and political participation. Women voices and, and interests must be taken into consideration in all decision making including those related to climate change. It's crucial to ensure women's representation and influence in all negotiation, in all political negotiation and in all decision making. And in this regard, I would like to, to mention two good practices from the Basque Country. Um, first, it's a quota system established by law, thanks to which 40% of uh, elected officials are women. And the second one is the network of elected women created in 2012 to network and share um, knowledge and, and women's experiences in local politics. The second uh, key element is the integrated approach. It has been mentioned before. Gender and environmental issues um, are all both horizontal and I think that an integrated, collaborative and coordinated approach um, can benefit both policies. In this sense, in the Basque Country, we have been collaborating um, the gender equality authorities with um, urban planning and environmental authorities for a long time. Mm. Um, we coordinate in areas, in areas such as gender budgeting and public procurement. And we have organized a lot of activities to link uh, to uh, those policies. The third key element, in my opinion, is involving men and boys. Boys and men are socialized and educated in a model of masculinity that is detrimental to women and detrimental also to our planet's ecological sustainability. Research shows that men have a less environmentally conscious lifestyle and a larger ecological footprint. It, al it also shows that they are more likely to deny ecological or environmental problems and to put short-term economic considerations ahead of ecological sustainability. This research also shows that men are less willing to make behavioral changes for the sake of the climate. It's therefore essential to involve men and boys in gender equality and in climate change issues. 
to change, or it's also essential to change gender norms and stereotypes in order to transform the still predominant sexist and toxic masculinity into masculinities that put equality and care for others and for the planet at the center. In this respect, in the Basque Country, in 2007, we launched a program called Gisondus. I'm at, aim at uh, involving men and boys in gender equality. And one of the outcomes of this uh, program is that more than 12,000 men have participated in gender equality training course. Thanks, Ander, and that's quite amazing to hear. Thank you very much. It's always great to have a man on a gender equality panel, I have to say, uh, bringing that perspective. And I think the Basque Country examples are really interesting. We also heard this afternoon in the gender responsive procurement session about clauses that are inserted into public procurement contracts that include things like training around sexist behavior, anti-harassment. These are ways in which you can get that message out and actually use both carrots and sticks to change behavior and to change those cultures. Cultures. So thanks for that. Thanks for all the panelists. We're, we're, we're going to run out of time if we're not careful. So what I'm going to do is bring in the three questions that have come in on Slido. And I think, to be honest, Linda, I'm looking at you. I hope you can read those questions. I'll read them out. Uh, we'll, we'll come over to you for those. Then I'm going to ask the panelists to give like one a short sentence or your message to the audience about the call to action, what we can do on gender equality. So the questions that came in on Slido for those who are not on, on the platform. First of all, one was, as a woman, I'm often not aware of how our cities have been planned from a male perspective, just because it's been done so for so many decades and it's so common. This is true. I think this awareness is, is missing and that's part of what Umio does. I'm sure there are many other women, non-male and queer people feel the same way. How do we find these blind spots? And it's the Umiya bus tour is definitely a great way to do that. So that's one question. Um, a lot of this conversation relies on good data analysis and insights about the local context as well as, uh, uh, that is gendered, as well as broader research. So can you give some examples of how cities can start to get that data to inform their decisions? Um, and then the last question is quite an interesting one about the renewables sector, uh, which I'm sure comes from the Just Transition team, looking about energy efficiency, how we're going to do energy refits, um, energy independence, alternative energy, the renewables sector. It says the jobs are supposed to uh, are expected to jump from 10.3 million jobs in 2017 to 29 million jobs in 2050. Currently, only 32% of those jobs are done by women. How do we change this? And do we have good examples? So, Linda, I'm going to ask you to, to answer maybe the first two of those, yeah? Yeah. Um, well, I think, um, I think it requires looking at your city from a different perspective. You can start by looking, what are the statues that we have in this city? What, are, what is the public art that we have in this city? Or public spaces, parks made for my body? Do I fit in or am I way too small to sit in a swing? Uh, mm. Like looking at the way that uh, a main norm has influenced just the design and the planning and the building of the city. But then I think it's also about connecting you can look at that, but then it's about connecting um, what kind of lives can be lived in this city. What is a difficult life in this city and what is an easier life in this city? What workplaces are easy to get to? Where is there free parking and where is there not? Like what kind of whose life is very made difficult and whose life is made easy in this city? Um, it's not a super concrete answer. You can com come to Umeå and do the bus tour. <laughs> uh, but I think if you start to look at something and you start to see that, then you will see the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And about data, I know that it can be tricky. And uh, I think that if we don't have data on local level that it gen is gender segregated, you can also always uh, maybe try to put a survey out where, which is gender segregated to the inhabitants, asking them a couple of questions. Or if there is national data, 
uh, that you have that is gender segregated, ask the question, is there anything that points to our city being different than the rest of the country? Uh, probably that data is also available. Sally also mentioned the AGE and the data that they have. So go to sort of the closest that you have, I think. Yeah. I think that's right. And one of the examples we have related to data in the updated Gender Equal Cities report is from Milan, where a group of a women's group have done a, what they call a gender atlas. And they themselves have gone around the city plotting and taking photographs and showing how women and girls are using the city and the differences. So there's quite, if you don't have the data, there's other ways of getting it. There's, there's ways of getting the data or trying to find it, but also other ways of building this picture of ways in which women and men might be using the city differently. Experiencing the city differently and using city services differently. And I think on the question on renewables, I just wanted to also say um, we, last week I heard, we heard from La Rochelle. I think they're in the room. I won't, I won't call on them right now. Uh, that La Rochelle there. The um, integrated action plan and in fact the small scale action from that network was around working with young people around choices to go into the STEM sector. So science, technology, en engineering, maths. And, and there are a lot, I think there are lots of initiatives all around Europe trying to alter this gender balance in the labor market, which in our previous report, one of our um, colleagues said, those, uh, the, gendered, the segregated labor market starts when a little boy is given a toy truck and a little girl is given a doll. Uh, and I think, you know, the, we have to start early with those sort of pipelines of talent going into the industries, especially these industries where there's huge growth and they're good jobs going forward. So, and it, it relates a little bit to the, the panel this morning. I think it's the same thing as with technology. We could see some similar projects in technology. So um, we've got five minutes left. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to, to, to make a plea to, the, to our participants here. What would you like them to do next uh, to, make, to connect sustainability and gender equality? Nuli. Um, I'm sure Bianca is going to say read the report, <laughs> but if she doesn't read the Gender Equal Cities report, it's on our website. Um, but sorry, so I'll, I'll steal a few seconds to say, um, we also have um, a lot of tools uh, on, on our website in particular, also in relation to the last question, we have developed um, a module on strategic procurement and it initially looked at um, uh, building in environmental and social clauses to, to public procurement contracts and we've just added a module um, on gender responsive public procurement. There was also a focus of a session earlier today. Uh, so. Yeah, we have practical tools and practical cases and examples for you to, to, to read and learn and to put into practice. So please do. Thank you. Bianca. Yes, do please read the report. <laughs> um, but also, above and beyond, I think my appeal with that sustainability, just like gender, at the end of the day is a values-based conversation. So I think it's important to keep going back there. And to the point of you know, the renewable energy sector, it's also about, you know, what, what pay structures, what do pay structures tell us about what kind of work do we value and what kind of work do we not value in society? And it might also about, uh, you know, changing um, pay structures and uh, men could be encouraged to go into care work if that seemed to be more economically viable. And also in terms of sustainability solution, not just think to the high tech shiny solar panels, but also low tech solutions that build capacity in the communities that live in areas that we you know, work with. And so uh, those I think are my two. Thanks, thanks Bianca. Linda. Uh, do not underestimate how difficult behavioral change is. Um, the same amount of money that you spend on a new technical innovation, you need to spend on behavioral change and you need to target specific groups. Otherwise, we are never going to get the results that we want from the interventions that we are doing or from the new technology that is being presented. It is so extremely um, there are extremely difficult structures to bend, so don't underestimate behavioral change and how yeah, difficult that's going to be. <laughs> Thanks, Linda and Ander. Well, I would say something very practical. I would encourage, encourage those of you working in the municipal areas or urban planning and environment to contact gender equality areas 
in, or gender specialist to organize an activity on gender and climate, climate change. That can be the first step. <laughs> That's a really good concrete first step. If you don't know the gender specialist in your, in your municipality or in your area, go and make friends with them, have a cup of tea with them, organize to do something together, start those collaborations. Uh, so I think that's a really good practical suggestion. Um, my, my suggestion or call to action is to continue this conversation, actually, because it's quite a new one to connect climate and, and sustainability and gender. And we need to, it, it's quite complex. It has lots of parts to it. So we need to continue it, perhaps in the context of Airbag 4 as well. There's going to be a continuing priority on gender equality, which is great, uh, but also maybe through network-driven activities. So it's important that we keep thinking about difficult things and keep trying to do the work on difficult things like behavior change. So thank you so much for listening in. Thank you so much to the panel for your fantastic inputs and conversation. If anybody wants to talk, uh, I think tonight everybody's a bit pooped. I think we're all going to be like not ready for talking anymore, but everybody's around tomorrow. If you want to come and have more conversations, please feel free to do that. I'm sure all, all of uh, Nula, Bianca, Linda and Anda like talking about this and would love to talk to you more. But for now, I'm going to finish and hand over to the MCs. And I also have a message about, a very practical message about headphones. If you have a headphone, please leave it on your seat. Don't walk away with it. But right now, I'm gonna say thank you to the panel and hand back to our MCs. Yeah, we need to go. Yeah. <laughs>